um, which will be continually changing and growing um, as we add more topics and figure out what people want to learn about to bring, you know, affordable education to everybody. And then, oh, this weekend, I'm going to be uh, teaching a bud tender workshop for Curious About Cannabis, and I'll be teaching kind of the uh, variation in cannabis portion of, of the workshop to uh, sort of teach, let bud tenders know, like, mm, you know, all the things, variations in, in, in genetic identities and how string names can be wrong, but it's not unique to cannabis. It's <laughs> in a lot of different industries and, uh, you know, how you figure out personal preferences and things like that. So that's going to be super fun. I'm super excited about that. And then after that, following directly following that, I'm going to be going to the beach because the weather in New Jersey has finally warmed up. <laughs> so it was like 30 degrees in my greenhouse today. It was like no shirt and shorts weather. It was awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's been, you know, I just moved here a year ago. So I'm in New Jersey. So I just moved here almost like a little over a year ago. And when we first got here at the very beginning of April, it was kind of kind of cool and foggy and rainy. But after we've been here for two weeks, it started to really like get sunshiny and hot. And by, you know, the first of May, we had to move the air conditioners from the shed back into the house because it was so hot. And, you know, it has been so cold up until like literally today. Today was like the, one of the first nice days where we could go and actually like put on short sleeves and shorts. I, I put on a bathing suit and go outside and sit outside and, you know, have a glass of wine and enjoy the squirrels and the dogs and, you know, the garden. And uh, I'm, I, I love spring and summer. So I'm so excited that the weather is finally fucking warming up. <laughs> It's been a miserable, miserable spring here in BC. It's like, it's been pretty rainy. It's like, we've gotten some good, sun. like it's not been horrendous, but it's not been great. I'll just say that much. It's been okay. It's been a lot of rain, a lot of regular days of rain. Um, we got a nice sunny day today. That was nice and hot. That was beautiful. Uh, again, we're here at the Dank Hour for the Dank Hour panel, Bugs, Bugs, Bugs Night. We're going to talk about summer protection, protecting your garden, so don't go anywhere. But we're getting into that shortly because we are giving Claude, our wonderful, Claude, our wonderful bug brain personality for the evening. That is our regular IPM expert that comes on and joins us for the show. Uh, he is uh, just rolling in to his home after a, a hectic week and a hectic weekend over at Lyft. So we're burning a little bit of time while he gets himself nice and comfortable and ready to go. And I'll tell you what, if you're on the YouTubes or you're on the any space and, and if you got bugs, it's not necessarily a bad thing. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. I'm excited for another evening of dank ass conversation, but I want to give you everybody a rundown before we'll talk. We'll, we'll, we'll get in a little burn a little bit more time before our, our special guest shows up, but I want to talk talk to you guys a little bit about what's happening in the future here because we have some not so stuff happening on the dank hour i've been and the entire team at the dank hour has been working their tail off to try and coordinate and and connect and and drive community forward and bring people on we have new moderators that will be joining us they they may or may not join this evening we'll find out as they just joined earlier this week uh, and we need to still coordinate a little bit with them but we'll have be having ryan lee and dr tess joining us on a regular basis on the stage but i want to give everybody a heads up because i do have some of this some of this stuff scheduled into the program as well because we're, we're trying to maintain and make sure everybody gets something to enjoy um, and that everybody gets to check it out so again we're the dank hour on tuesdays and right now we're sitting in 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 early may and we're looking at may the 17th we're on bugs 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 next week we have for you consumption and how it affects the human body i'm really excited for that one i don't see green so we're not fully confirmed there but we did confirm or i don't know we'll we'll get to we'll ask in a little bit we'll, we'll find out in the back we'll let you know who's going to be coming in as a guest a little bit later on for that one on the 31st we have uh uh, we're doing like a ganji and canadian solomary sommelier cannabis programs looking at how each each group and individual and education in general when it comes to post-secondary talk about speaking of which we were just chatting about that with dr anibus and then on the third that would be the 31st on retail trends and on june 7th we have white rabbit gummies and guys i don't know if any of you uh, any of the other moderators on the panel have received their gummies yet but i have 
and they're absolutely ridiculously delicious. So I know that they're on their way if you haven't received them yet. I also live in the same area, so it probably didn't take very long for them to get here. Um, but there's some awesome stuff. It, and Nada, it has been a while since I have had the fortunate chance to, you know, share space with you. How are you doing, Anita? What are you up to and how's your garden growing? Oh, hi, everyone. I know it's been a minute, right? Um, it's been kind of a crazy time. Uh, my garden's getting cleaned up. Again, I totally relate. I'm kind of, I think, on the same area sort of as Dr. Anibis because uh, it's just got nice, like, recently. <laughs> in Ontario, Southern Ontario. So um, not nice enough to, I, I know some people have been planting stuff outside, but I am May 2-4 weekend has traditionally been my <laughs> weekend to plant. So I think I'm going to be sticking to that. But yeah, I got a bunch of stuff going outside and a bunch of stuff in my tent. Um, I tried my hand at cloning recently. So that was fun. Um, they all survived. So I was pretty pumped about that. So yeah. Um, went to the lift convention in Toronto too. Um, that was pretty awesome. I met up with a bunch of people and saw some friends just for the day, but, um, yeah, keeping busy doing stuff. Um, working on my new, business venture and things like that. I don't know if you guys know, but I'm in the um, marketing and sales part of uh, the industry in Ontario. So working on some projects here too. So yeah, so, um, you know, by the end of the day though, most of the time, cause this is on at eight o'clock in my area zone. So I'm so tired um, that the last few I've just been out. So uh, I'm really happy to be here. I saw Claude at uh, Lyft and Co. And I uh, saw his crazy mites, um, which was really cool. Um, I have a video posted on my Instagram um, and it looks like he's flipping me off, but he's not. He's just scratching his finger. <laughs> it's high. Um, but now you guys all have to look. So um, it's that's what we'd said if anybody wants to check it out. So. Awesome. Well, it sounds like things are going well. It's great to have you on stage again, Anita. Johnny, I hope you're doing well. And I'm I'm probably getting you mid long toke or mid 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 hit, as always. Um, but if if you're there and available and not suffocating from a long toke, let me know, and I would love to hear about what's growing in your garden, how you're doing. While we burn a little bit of time for our uh, speaker to get comfortable and join us for the evening. <laughs> Hey, London, you actually just uh, just caught me right before the bong toke. <laughs> um, woot, woot, woot. Yeah, perfect timing. So, yeah, everything on my end is going well. I'm kind of slow this season, um, but everything's going well. Just uh, just doing my thing, helping out a few buddies at their, their spots. And it's been a rough rough spring i heard you talking about how in bc it's been kind of uh the weather's not been the best and it's been kind of inclement and it's same same down here in in northern california um a lot of the farmers that i know they they tried to get ahead of the game and plant early and the weather did not cooperate and it it's finally starting to turn around but there was a couple weeks of just snow and hail and rain and clouds so yeah there's it's you know with all of that becomes a whole bunch of other issues um that i'm I'm trying to help mitigate at my buddy's spot um but yeah things are going good um i had to as you may know i mean i know you know london but had to uh kind of gear down on my little indoor project and i'm kind of just refining it and and um bringing things close and just doing a little hunt and and finding some good genetics while I look for another place to set up um, shop where I could do that comfortably and not have to scramble. But yeah, I'm really excited. I have, um, I have a few different things that I'm hunting and sifting through right now. Uh, a sour diesel, Alder Point Sour Diesel by Aficionado and a Farmer's Fire by Second uh, Generation Seeds, I believe, or Genetics, which is DJ Short's son. And that's a cherry pie crossed with a DJ Shorts blueberry. So I'm really excited just to, to do that. And I'm not really at this point in time uh, doing anything for profit. It's just for, for head stash and just for keeping me entertained. But I'm, I'm really excited nonetheless because it's, 
you know, it's always fun to see new new genetics and it kind of sift through some stuff and pop seeds. So that's where I'm at right now. And I'm, you know, loving life. It's springtime and thing, life is good. So happy to be here with everybody. And I'm glad that I, my life is kind of settling down where I could be back in on these, these rooms every week. Well, we do enjoy having you here. That is a for sure ski. Um, I have been working on because I've been wanting to do some like regenerative style shows here and there. Um, so we do have that put into this schedule. I just got to kind of finalize. It's like holding on to smoke, trying to get some of these speakers to commit to a time in the space. You know, it's just, it's not super easy, but when they do, they're always there and always a, a tentative. So it's been, it's been really nice. I've had a good year. I've, I've got more plants than I know what to do with. Um, from the Acapulco Gold Lemon Kush headband crosses that I did myself to, you know, some of the um, some of the Velvet Skies to some of my older stuff that I that I just need to get a little bit better of a store up. There's there's actually a competition uh, coming up, and we're just burning some time here. We'll wait for our our esteemed guests to join us. Uh, there's actually a co Canadian cannabis competition happening in uh in the kootenays here in canada that i just found about it's been running for a little bit um apparently Ke kevin jodry is going to be visiting and there are going to be some really awesome people i did hear about a, a, an actual competition um that's have happening to four locals acmpr growers here in bc they're also going to be doing a conference and stuff like that called the unicorn cup um, so I'm excited because we're going to do, we're going to do, uh, we're going to try and be there as a media partnership and, and, and support them and be there for their whole big event with their cannabis competition in the Kootenays um, and also record some of their speakers and, and do some really cool fireside chats and some, some fun stuff. It's going to be a really interesting uh, period of time and I'm excited to really get into the culture and meet some of the people one of the weird things about Canada is we've all been kind of re recluse and separated from each other we've been kind of like satellite um, beings in in some in some points of reference so there can be like these cool events or unique things that happen that just like come out of nowhere and you're like it's been going for a bit it's, it's great to find out and connect with these people so I'm really excited but welcome I, I, I welcome to the stage our esteemed guest for the day. We man, we we hung in there. We held some conversation and and, and made sure to enjoy uh, a little bit of talk and everything like that. Claude, how are you doing? How is Lyft? Um, how is everything with you today? We appreciate you taking the time to join us. We understand that you're you're quite a busy guy with the last couple of weeks. So thank you for being. are on mute as a heads up oh and i did I, well while claude's getting off of you, uh, yes i'll just give it oh there you go say hello <laughs> yeah hi everybody um yes uh, a victim of our success <laughs> I say. but it's exciting um that's it uh, i've been back from lyft it was amazing uh, to see people again without a mask too uh, it was beautiful outside. A lot of people were hanging out outside. Uh, also, uh, so I presented my crazy mites to people. A lot of people were really amazed uh, seeing them live just in front of their face. That you didn't need any lens to magnify in them. Uh, so uh, that's it. So I've been. I drove seven hours yesterday, and today I visited the facility. Uh, so I never stopped, but I, I was kind of, I almost had forgotten about the show. I thought it was on the 29th and then five minutes before, oh, <laughs> I have to be at that show. So I know what I'm going to talk about, but uh, anyways, I'm glad to be here and uh, with everyone and uh, to share about the summer preparations uh, to have uh, healthy crops without any pest infestation or disease. I prepped. I I I I listened to Dr. Anibis's course on pest prevention and and pathogens just beforehand to make sure I was as prepared as possible for today's conversation. There's some fun stuff happening and 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 we're doing some neat stuff. I mean, we're gonna release some bugs tomorrow, aren't we, Claude? We're gonna we're gonna release some some lace wing 
some brown lace wings. So let's 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 jump into the conversation a little bit here, and I'll let you get a little bit more comfortable and and relax and have another puff, and 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 hopefully I, I won't grab uh, Johnny too much in the middle of it. There's Doctor Mark upon us, uh, and I won't bother too much with it you know what we'll do is we'll, we'll give it a chance we'll give you another minute to have one more tote claude so you can relax and get comfortable dr mark how is everything growing in your world welcome to the stage if you're available to say hello we all had a wonderful week with you last week and hey everyone how's everyone doing yeah doing just great uh enjoying this lovely spring evening weather's great where i am how is it where you are finally nice it's been miserable for a little while to be honest it's it's been a lot of rain and my wife has been bitter at me for it um it's not her fault but it is apparently mine um so we deal with it as it is, <laughs> as it were uh but hopefully you're doing well and, and healthy and and everything's going good with you yes yes back to uh essentially 100 percent health i would say but covid did definitely kick my ass but it's good to be back what i notice is i do get tired in the afternoon i think a lot of people say that but um i think covid definitely um takes a little bit out of your energy level i hear there's this the the covid grog for a long period of time well, now that Claude is probably well consumed and ready to go, let's get the conversation started. We're, we, we've posed these conversations in, in an interesting way where we've actually, you know, started back in January, I think was our first conversation, right, Claude? And, and yes. we, yeah, we started there and kind of talked about what can we do prepping into the spring season? What, what can we do mid spring season? So let's start that conversation here. We're getting into summer protection um, and what we're going to need to do to ensure our space. Let's talk about what you do or what you suggest people to do to prevent pests and to inspect their space and to check levels. Like what's the, that process look like and what's the best way to go about checking to see, you know, do I have pests? Is there anything wrong? Let's look at identification a little bit and get and back it up and get started. Oh, for sure. Uh, when we want to identify, uh, first, know the history, uh, what we're growing, uh, what, it, what, what will it attract? summer is happening <clears throat> the cycles of the insects pests are already started so we have to make sure that we are protected for example <clears throat> out east we have to protect against the corn borer so we have to know when it starts and when it ends um, so we are able to protect uh, our crops with trichogramma wasps so uh, trichogramma wasps are, we have different species according to which type of caterpillar that you want to uh, protect yourself. I mean, your crop, I mean. So uh, we have some that are protect corn, different types of boars, but we have others that are also will target uh, specific caterpillars that could munch on your plants um, and without affecting the other insects. And it will be also in a way that it will be only the caterpillar that you want. It's more, it's better in a way than uh, BT could be because BT uh, will kill all uh, the different uh, caterpillars. It won't be selective like trichogrammas would be. So uh, it is a, a better way. Um, the thing is, is that in the spring, we had to make sure that we had companion plants uh companion plants to attack to attract uh, predators and parasitoids and uh, also companion plants that could be deterrents for certain uh, pests so we check on those we take care of these um so that's uh, one way if we had issues with um uh, spider mites it's still the time to introduce uh neozilius phalasis uh, predatory mite that will live in your garden and will uh, take care of brown mites and spider mites. And they're native to North America. They were found in Ontario. So uh, they pretty much could be used from BC to uh, Newfoundland. 
no, uh, Newfoundland, sorry about that. Newfoundland has a really limited uh, list of beneficial insects they can uh, purchase and due to their insular uh, nat uh, nature of their the island the, of Newfoundland. So is it like a they, they don't want to allow like species in that could potentially take over or be invasive to the space? Can you like why what's what's happening? Yeah, it is the main reason. In fact, uh, they follow closely. Uh, we we um, were able to get um, MDC Swirsky accepted. Um, we are waiting. We did a second request for Gelolapsky LSPI. Um, which is the cousin of Stratulilaps sinensis, which is hippo, uh, known also as a hippo aspis. Um, Miles, the uh, its whole name, it's a predatory mite that we use in the soil uh, to target uh, all sorts of um, and the pupa of crypts or the, all the swell dwelling flies like uh, fungus gnats and short flies. They will attack their larva. So, uh, anyways, so we prefer, I prefer Gelolaps, but I'm not able to send any to people in the USA and or in Newfoundland. It is a, but in a way, uh, I respect that they trying to not cause any catastrophe like uh, what happened with the Asian ladybug when they released them and now they're invading North America and taking over. I think that's a really funny, you know, it's interesting to look at like like what we've done like i think it's like you introduce frogs into australia or something like that to to do something that totally roots so it's just like following the right lines and doing these things appropriately and safely are really important now one thing that we were mentioning before you came into the show is a lot of us have had some pretty dreary springs like it, here in bc we have not had a great spring whatsoever um it, and it doesn't look like it's going to get any better it's supposed to be cooler than normal um, we're supposed to be laying as opposed to the last few years, which had been just like hot and dry. So naturally going into this period of time, some people might be planting some auto flowers or bringing some auto flowers outside that are that might even be starting to hit their flower period. You know, going into looking like we're going to have a wet, damp, um, cooler summer period and spring period here. What are some suggestions and preventative methods that you can suggest? <laughs> To, uh, to to really make sure that, A, maybe you're not going to run into any pathogens such as molds. Uh, B, you know, is, is something that you're going to have to worry about coming up later into this season. Um, and we're, we'll focus the conversation as we usually do specifically with the cannabis plant. Yes, um, I'm not uh, distributing it, but there's a new um, uh, product it's called Timerix Gold. It's a tea tree. Uh, extract. It's approved for outdoor use to on cannabis. Uh, so it's been approved for greenhouse and indoors and also at the same time um, outdoors. And some scholars and I know that are specialists in pathogen uh, really are enthusiastic. They're, uh, they're doing tryouts right now with it to see how efficient it is. So I'll, I'll get back to you when I get some more results. It's promising to have a new tool that's organic uh, in our toolbox too. Um, so um, this is a way to, to prevent. It, it is also to not try to, but I mean, if you already planted your plants are too late, but not bunch them all together. Uh, air circulation is, is important. Uh, some people are in the school of leaving all the leaves on and some people are heavy defoliators. Um, it depends me, I, I say it depends on the strain and the circumstances. Uh, the thing is also uh, removing the, 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 the bottom leaf uh, will help to uh, usually some, the, the pests will start from the, the, the bottom and then climb up. Uh, so that way you might clean up a bit uh, that way. Um, so what could I, suggest for pathogens um it's that's it if in the future if it hasn't been done try also to get um varieties that are, are, are resistant or are not too uh that don't have flowers that are too tight buds are too tight because uh, 
that way Bretagne just has better start uh, way to start. Uh, this uh, summer we are testing a project uh, with a company. Uh, I will tell you when it's on and when, because I haven't signed any NDA or anything like that. But um, this technology with uh, inter intelligence or to artificial intelligence has been used in greenhouses and indoor buildings but we are trying it outdoors uh different cameras we, we set up at this uh outdoor cannabis producer site and it's a really amazing technology what i've seen yet they were able to detect botrytis at the calyx level uh so i think it's one of the the ways of the future i mean for commercial producers uh for for us, uh, I mean, the regular citizen that just have their their medical patch or anything like that, is to make sure that you um, you inspect your plants often. Uh, you know, uh, it's you have to find the first signs uh, that happen, so that way you can discard these plants or section of the plant that are diseased, or intervene with an organic product. Um, so that's uh, something important if we could uh, check on. I, I think you touched on a really key factor. Like there's like all the all the sprays and crap won't, in the world won't won't um, prevent a poorly managed plant. <laughs> you know, like no matter you can spray all the crap you want in the world, but if your plants are overly crowded and you don't de defoliate whatsoever, and you and you cramp them and you put them in a steamy greenhouse without any proper breathing or proper airflow, you're going to create problems and issues regardless. Um, so speaking of that and, and kind of creating that airflow and that growth, um, I've heard suggestions before on, you know, hey, I have a, a mite or a pest issue or a bug issue. I, I, I'm, I, people suggest defoliating the plant and removing as much of the leaf tissue as, as them to arrive. What's your kind of suggestion there? Is that a good uh, methodology in general or thought process? Or is this, can this lead to stressing the plant out and allowing the plant to not have the support that it needs to be able to deal with the stress that it's already taken on? I believe that uh, deleafing a plant really stresses it. Um, usually, I would only remove disease leaf or or uh, leaf that would be really uh, attacked by the pests, or um, because uh, I believe that it would give an extra stress to the plant and let it its uh, immune system down and let it maybe more prone to uh, different attacks from different pathogens. Awesome. Now, so there are other methods, and I did want to touch on those a little bit because I know there's there's going to be some people in my area that are seriously worried about about IAPM pest control. Johnny, you know, if I don't, I'm going to give you a second. I'm just going to say your name now, so and, and and speak a little bit. You know what I'll even do is because we're at the 30 minute mark, I'll do a reset. So we're resetting the room and relighting the room here and letting everybody know that it is the Dank Hour here for the Dank Conversation with Dank Experts, where we get amazing panel of experts together to have amazing conversation and and rotate through the conversation each week. We have everything from Cody Peterson next week um, showing up as our one and only feature guest to discuss about how cannabis affects the human body to um, horticulture with some of the most amazing folks that there are. I I'm excited for each week of conversation. We get to dig into some dank stuff. Now, Johnny, I was just about to dig into like what in your world of, of you know, natural farming and regenerative farming methods are you using to prevent or deal with bacteria on a regular basis? Is there something that you suggest? Are you using lab spray on a regular basis? Can you talk about a little bit if you are using that, something like that, how are you using it as a preventative and, and so on? If, if you're available, I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm available. So you're asking about like uh, pathogens particularly? Yeah, like, like if you're well. going into a if you're going into a wet wet spring and you know it's going to be wet and cool, what are you going to do to like really stay on top of it? Now? Okay, all right. So you know, really, I think a, a major thing that tends to get overlooked a lot is airflow, and um, having kind of a, a 
stuffy greenhouse or a room in general, it really it opens up a whole host of issues with, uh, you know, botrytis setting in um, or, or something like powdery mildew. And, um, you know, honestly, I think that the best way to combat this is, is a preventative measure, but sometimes you can't really prevent it or your efforts at prevention kind of fall short. Um, but really, it's for me, if you, if you can, um, having that airflow, having your humidity in check and having your temperature in check and kind of in like an acceptable uh, BPD range for your, your particular setup goes a long, long way. Um, however, that's not the be all end all and issues will still manifest often. Um, and it's kind of unavoidable, you know, it's part of part of farming in, in general and, and producing any crop. So um, something that I just um, did actually is um, a spot that I'm working, they're dealing with some, some botrytis or what I'm assuming is botrytis, um, kind of colonizing the the stalk of their plants and it's it's pretty gnarly um the situation at hand it's uh, maybe i'll do a ptr of uh a affected plant but it's really bad and i kind of caught it you know i wish i could have caught it two days three days sooner but i caught it just in time for my friend where it didn't kill all of his plants that were affected by it but something that i did is you know this is a really advanced case of, of botrytis affecting the stems so usually I would try to just go the, the route of inoculating with labs or liquid IMO or Jadam microbial solution. But in this particular, or even sulfur, um, but in this particular situation, it was really, really advanced. So the first thing I did was I um, applied a hydrogen peroxide at 3% on the botrytis and kind of knocked it back. And then I, after that, um, I let that kind of do its thing for a few hours, and then I applied um, some lactic acid bacteria in hopes that it will colonize and kind of prevent that botrytis from from coming back full strength. Um, however, if that falls short, I think the route that we're going to go is doing some kind of uh, micronized sulfur and, and putting that on the the affected area in particular, um, just to to nip it in the bud, so to speak. Um, but yeah, I mean, really the issue I, I see it manifested from just improper climate control. It was rainy and cold. And also this person had their drip irrigation running these last kind of cold rainy days. So that plus lack of airflow, um, it's just a recipe for disaster. So I'm hoping I, I think I saved most of the plants that were affected. Um, you can't say for sure until you know some more time goes by but that's kind of my go-to approach um is using some kind of inoculant if the problem's not super bad um and just actually using that as a preventative even if it's you know my own stuff i'll apply lab and liquid imo um just to keep those things at bay instead of reacting to the problem trying to prevent it from ever happening in the first place but so i'm gonna ptr that um those affected plants. And it's a really gnarly example of botrytis and, and how it can affect um, your plants. And it's, you know, it can be lethal. You know, I, I saw one plant that actually succumbed to this, this fungal infection and it's uh, seeing it, you know, I was kind of appalled and it's, it's not something pleasant to see, but it's a amazing learning experience and a time to put these practices, um, you know, at, put them to the test, you know, really see it's like, do these things work? Um, so yeah, I'm going to, I'll have an update next week on how that goes, but I'm going to do a PTR right now and, and, uh, give it to the next person. Awesome. Now, you know what, we might take a, a chance here, Todd, and talk about what we're going to be doing tomorrow for a moment and talk about late, uh, brown lace wings. Now I'm familiar with green lace wings. Is there something that's, that, that I think is pretty well known? Can you tell me a little bit about brown lace wings? What's the difference in kind of like, are, are they mostly the same? What's going on? What's with the color change? Yes. Okay. Uh, that's it. So it's it's not the ground the the ground <laughs> the green lacewing. Um, there's two species of green lacewing. Uh, there's Cruzapella carnea 
and uh, Chrysoperla refilabris. Uh, we rear uh, Carnea. Uh, there's not much difference between the two greens, but there is a big difference with the other species. Uh, the brown lacewing, which is known as its Latin name, is Micromus variatus. So it's a cute name, Micromus variatus. Um, it is really a top aphid predator. Uh, the thing also, the difference between them is that the green lace wings, uh, the adults will eat nectar and pollen, but they won't eat any aphids. So, uh, the brown lace wing, um, the micromus, it will eat, uh, the adults will eat, also eat uh, aphids. So you don't have to have any pollen or nectar around, they'll, they'll do okay on their meat <laughs> diet. So, um, it's, uh, it's really that um, they're very voracious too, both in the larval and adult stage. So uh, that's that's something that uh, sets them apart. And uh, so we we will. Uh, I'm supposed to have. Uh, I don't even know if I think they play some larva and some adult in the what we'll have to release tomorrow, or maybe it will just be larva. Anyways, it will be fun because they. They will go for aphids right away. I don't think they'll be as shy as the anistis was at the first time we released them. <laughs> um, and um, the micromus will lay eggs uh, singularly uh, just near aphids. So uh, they look like little, like these little gel pills, uh, the eggs, and they'll be laid just around the, just next to the aphid, ready to. Uh, to uh, to uh, as soon as they they emerge of the eggs they'll be uh, already hungry and uh, they'll be uh, chasing the uh, they are also like other lacewing species they're cannibalistic when the food is scarce and when the densities uh, of their population are too high um, so uh, anyways I, I was I will leave some uh, so, some for tomorrow <laughs> when we see them in, in <laughs> Well, here, here's something that often comes up and that I've actually heard a few times in the last little bit, because as summer hits and the heat warms up, you know, we have a lot of bugs that get more active. One thing that is often and run into an issue is, and while it doesn't particularly affect cannabis most of the time, it can bring along other issues, is ants. Do you want to chat a little bit about ants and ants? And, because, like, I, I know not all species of ants are a problem or issue, but there's some that, 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 can bring or haul aphids and defend colonies of aphids um is there ant prevention methods and what what's a good methodology or thought process when you're looking at ants as a problem and relieving that problem or or an over environment uh ants yes it could be a real problem um sometimes in reason um i had the first time i noticed these problems i was uh, scouting blueberry fields and some farmers add the, these ants that do colonies under the roots, so the it would affect their plants. Um, and I saw that also happen at the licensed producers uh, in their mother plants uh, or their grandmother plants. I would call them when they keep them more than six months, um, or even uh, like even a year or more. Uh, sometimes uh, then it could happen. Uh, the the ants can invade and affect. Uh, the plant because they will they will also um, go into the the cambium of the plant they will go and eat and affect the plant they will get the sugars in the plant and what we were talking about um, the other issue with the ants especially in greenhouses is that uh, it, it will um, they farm the the aphids so they will protect their their uh, their, uh, <laughs> I forgot my, the, the word, but uh, they're, they will... they're cattle. They're cattle. Exactly, they're cattle exactly. They're not... exactly. It's like they're they're they're, they're cattle. They, they will protect them uh, against any parasitoids or predators that try to attack their their cattle. So uh, when we are, if ants are there and doing that, uh, we have to make sure that we take care of the ants before we take care of the aphids. So, inside in, in in a greenhouse, I would use some borax and sugar, and do a mix. Um, then you place them on plates, 
certain space, uh, certain places in the greenhouse, and uh, they will find it in uh, less than a day. And you will see uh, hundreds of ants uh, feasting on the sugar, and they're getting high on the sugar. And some of them like will leave and say, "Hey, let's bring some up to the the queen." So so she eats that too. It's one delicious. So she they bring some borax and sugar to the queen and kill her that way. So uh, that way the colony dies, and that way you are safe with your plants with the aphids. Uh, sorry for the ants, but you know you have to to choose and to protect what you your your couple of plants. Uh, the ants, anyways, I, I don't I have no uh, worries really for them. They're really uh, tenacious little uh, insects. I, I, yeah, they're very tenacious. I was reading because I like I find this an interesting subject. Uh, weird enough, I find a lot of weird subjects fairly interesting. But I, I found this one particularly interesting because. Um, there are now you can buy colonies of, of zombie ants, I think they call them or something where it's like it's an ant mother and colony that that doesn't actually like make a home and produce its own colony. It like kind of goes and steals a bunch of colony and then like moves from spot to spot doing it. But I thought that'd be kind of an interesting methodology to using it. Maybe there's a potential there. Maybe I just read complete bullshit, um, but I'm pretty sure it's it's a, it's a real thing. Um, I think there's there's a lot of interesting methods and, and, and ways to go about. I've heard of orange peels being thrown in, allowing them to mold uh, can be useful. I've heard of a few different things, uh, but I like the borax. A lot of people have pets and stuff like that. So that's usually not a great opportunity for your home person, but in, in a larger space, it will definitely work really quite well. Um, are there other issues, like you talked about them coming up, are there minor pests that we don't really need to be concerned about or are there certain things that we should keep an eye out for that are kind of shocking i mean like bc is interesting in the fact that we have a very diverse weather like back and forth we'll have a lot of wet or a little a little bit of dry and a lot of wet so we often have to deal with um, a lot more pathogens and molds than anything um, is there is there anything of concern that you've noticed coming into this spring summer season? Are we seeing any more hot latent virus virus up here? Or are you hearing about um, you know larger infestations of aphids hitting greenhouses? Is there something of note or concern that we should be keeping an eye out for, or or, or something like that? And then on, on, on top of that question as well, uh, apart from things that might be a concern that we should be keeping an eye out for, what's kind of a good starter method or thing for people that might be tuning in for the first time that are probably going to get it, get into bugs for the first little bit or or try purchasing them i know a lot of people get pushed towards things like uh, praying mantises and stuff like that while they look cool i don't think they're super great so i love those kind of if you uh, can, can answer those two questions okay the um, uh, concerning the borax and sugar uh, for pets and our children are uh, babies are like <laughs> they're like uh, on their uh, on the ground, and you would you would put them at uh, out of reach uh, in a way. The ants will find them, and way they'll find the sugar. The ants that can climb walls, so you put that uh, <laughs> out of reach as a safety measure. If you have pets that uh, would slurp that uh, borax and sugar, um, so that I would do um, to. Um, prevent um to, to make the viruses uh you have to do in an uh, uplight viroid doesn't really um show up first um it needs to you need that added um since the the first year they started really monitoring it in the industry uh, I think they, they they were really scared because they found more than sixty percent. If I remember well, it was down to less than thirty percent because uh, people were aware of it and they took steps to prevent that or to avoid the uh, the spring the spreading of it. Uh, that's one viroid. Uh, I remember in my days in raspberries, we had many many viroids. Uh, some would show up in uh, certain strains and some certain strain would ca be carriers but they would be asymptomatic like uh, for covid like thing or 
uh, it wouldn't show up, but they would transmit it then to the next row, which had a different cultivar, and that cultivar was affected. Um, so, in fact, you have to um, to make sure that when you check um, that that you you know also the difference uh, between uh, abiotic factors. Um, some people will think something happened, like I visited the facility this uh, today, and at one at the fourth leaf stage, all the leaves were kind of crinkled and yellow and brown spots, and, and I knew it was an abiotic factor. It wasn't a disease, and then I learned from the irrigation crew that the problem had happened at exactly that stage, and the plants were almost like uh, were lacking water. So when they came back up, uh, I mean, the new foliage was looking good, but the one that was affected at that time, like developed, uh, like uh, it was dying, you know, so it, it will say that way. And some people will say, oh, maybe it's fusarium or pitium or something like that. But it was just an abiotic factor uh, that uh, happened. So biotic factor, it is, it is present. So the difference between the two, in fact, uh, abiotic factors, there'll be uniform symptoms. Like I, I, I saw, it was always at the fourth leaf stage that all the leaves were affected. And with biotic factors, the, the symptoms, they appear to be uneven. Um, and with abiotic factors, the symptoms, they, they'll be uh, uniform or discrete in a discrete area. Um, and uh, the the biotic factor that the affected plants will be spread out through the throughout the area. Um, so you have to know the the difference between uh, to not panic <laughs> if something happened. Oh, you see, uh, oh, it's not a disease. It's just that 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 we forgot to water them, <laughs> and uh, something happened, and that's what happened. <laughs> Oh my God, I forgot to water. Let's throw everything we can at the plant. <laughs> How many times is like, it's like the panic chop or the freak out. You see people, you see people just do that. Totally. Um, exactly. And I never put a, like a plant that was too thirsty. Like some people would still feed it, let it drink, recover, and then you can feed it again. Um, so, that's it. You have to. Uh, one thing I learned uh, lately, I'd forgotten about uh, Epsom salt. Um, if you have powder mildew, uh, will help. Uh, if you do foliars of uh, Epsom salt, it will help uh, uh, deal with the uh, powder mildew without use, without having to use a specific fungicide or anything like that. Especially if you're uh, uh, if the fungicide is kind of uh, can be abrasive like to the plant like uh, potassium bicarbonate like a uh, mill stop or uh, or uh, lactic acid or citric acid like uh, different products like uh, cyclone or uh, lactosan or any milk too like uh, uh, like any uh, lactic acid so uh, so, so I just saw this awesome picture come up here. Johnny, right there next to you, has has put his PTR up, and that is one hell of a plant. And I'm gonna bring it up so that people can see it a little bit better on the on the YouTube. This is the best I can do here, but you can see that photo there if you click on Johnny next to you, Claude. You should be able to bring up that photo all the way. Now, I would love to know what your suggestion would be in this period. I've heard, heard what Johnny's alternative was. Let's hear. Plan, not what his what his at plan of action is going to be. What would you suggest for fucking that is some bad, that's a bad botrytis. That is really bad. What do you suggest? If you're available. You, you are on mute still, I believe, unless I'm glitching out. 
London, he might just be speechless about about having a solution for that. Because <laughs> it's like, like I said, that's, I feel like almost seconds away from death there. Um, and I caught one plant that was dead. That's kind of what alerted me that there was an issue. And then not much investigation. And I saw that it was running rampant and it was extremely bad. But to my knowledge, all of the other plants are still alive, which is a, pretty much a miracle. That, that's crazy. My understanding was once it surrounded the whole stem and, and essentially it infected the cambium layer all the way around, it was done from that point up, which is just crazy. So, I mean, like, I mean, it looks like it's still alive. Yeah, you know, and it was probably like 1% away and those plants are, are going to struggle and limp um, through the rest of their lives. And honestly, once they kind of mature more, it's, you know, it's not over yet. Even if it stops now, it's still like there's that potential that, you know, a few weeks down the road, you know, they get reinfected. There is just really like it's a major open wound on the plant. Um, so I think the sulfur layer is really probably the next step to to just try to keep those things alive because that's all you could do. They're in like hospice late stage care right now. Um, and we'll see. If I, we can I get like them. that comp- <laughs> for real i like i'm still blown away looking at it. i'm like oof, that is that is gnarly uh, are you there claude or are you speechless or did we just lose you for a moment yes i love it it's great <laughs> gray mold and we can say it's gray mold uh, yeah um So, like you had said before, for sure, um, hydrogen peroxide will help, a light solution of it, but also at the same time, it could also open up more for uh, scars, for more infection. So, it is a double-edged sword in some way, sometimes, uh, hydrogen peroxide. But um, it could do wonders, even the root pathogen. Uh, You make sure that you have the right concentration, because you don't want to burn your root. But it could be a, like a, a like a help to turn your your roots back to white, from yellow to white. I saw that I, I did it before, like years ago. Um, so, botrytis, what a disease! Uh, especially that happens so late sometimes that you think you avoided it, and your bodies are so nice, and then it starts getting and then. Disaster. Um, in fact, it's always like try to avoid, try to discard, uh, try to um, once you identified it, uh, it's the first thing that we we can do to to try to uh, to make sure that it doesn't spread too much. Uh, so if, let you. <laughs> Awesome. So hydrogen peroxide is actually start giving it giving you spray down and trying to put preventative layers to try and work the way up. That is some some bad botrytis. Now we are tr- going to be really nice tonight because we don't want Claude's Claude's had a really crazy weekend. I'm going to try and go through and and get some of the questions and keep this at about an hour tonight. Um, so one of the first questions that was that that comes up here that I am able to find is for you, Claude is regarding aphids is there something i can that will kill aphids instantly um, that you can recommend or it or would you avoid things that don't kill things instantly you mean to use a pesticide against aphids yeah yeah i guess anything they're saying like because you know a lot of people sometimes would be suggested neem or 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 oh. hydro you know what i mean like yes, would, yes, is yes. there something that kills them right off the bat like you spray it and they die uh the neem or as uh, as a max uh, as, as a directin uh is a growth disruptor for them so the oil will suffocate and uh, the action of the um, uh, the um, the neem oil will prevent it to molt because they uh, we ha- we have to um to make sure that we uh, 
uh, disrupt them if we're going to use something else like Bovaria, uh, Bastiana strain. Um, we we have a, a strain that's approved for outdoors. It's going to be approved, I hope. I'm crossing my fingers just on time for this year um, for outdoor production because it's been approved for indoor and outdoor uh, in greenhouse, I mean, but not for outdoors yet. Uh, it's been approved last year, uh, three years ago in California and then in the USA and last year in Canada for different crops like potatoes, tomatoes, uh, eggplants, uh, for turf, um, because we don't affect, pollin it doesn't affect pollinator and does it, most of the beneficials. So um, this is something that could kill a lot of aphids if the conditions are right, if it's humid and you had to spray before the sundown. Um, and if you could add to that the growth disruptor, then you would sure that they wouldn't molt uh, right away the bovaria that's been deposited on them. So um, that you could have success with that. Um, and a good prevention is always the best to have the uh, aphid predator midge present to do releases of, of it early in the season uh, to make sure that it will find plants, uh, companion plants, that they will, they will uh, establish themselves in, uh, and take care of the aphids. It's one of the best uh, ways I've, I find that's not too expensive and uh, works well in our in our climates outdoors. I have better success with it uh, indoor, outdoors than uh, indoors, uh, because usually uh, the fan speeds and things like that sometimes in certain uh, in certain uh, facilities, it, they're a bit too uh, high for it to to be able to uh, to fly well. Uh, it's always usually works at dusk and dawn. Uh, it's so we it's hard to, they are to to find to scout, but you know they're present and they will they take care of the if it colonies. And and is this the crazy mite? Um, I'm gonna try it this year uh certain places that we know that the aphids are going to present this year in the cannabis plants so uh, we will have a trial of them this year so I, I will be able to tell you more in the fall about that but uh or as it happens as a we have observations of that and also the the green lace swing or the brown lace swing um the green lace swing is a bit cheaper though uh, you can use eggs too could um, broadcast eggs that could help uh, so uh, this is a, a couple of ways we can fight the aphids uh try to favor surface flies other flies uh this could help too uh, yes hoverflies anyway i totally was just talking and totally like muted <laughs> Awesome. Other flies are new. I have a ton of those just floating around my space. Now, uh, I don't see anybody raising their hand in the audience. I don't see a lot of questions coming through on the future cannabis project side chat. So we'll try to finish it up a little bit early. Do we have any questions from our panel of experts for Claude today? Uh, I just have something a little question. So I have noticed in a couple of my grows, my home grow and, and in a greenhouse grow, that when aphids come, they kind of just gravitate towards particular plants. They don't like uniformly infect everything or infest everything. Is there a reason or do, do you know why aphids gravitate towards particular because like one year we had one plant that was just covered in them and instead of like trying to battle with them we just moved that plant away from everything else that plant was infested it was very sick and we just let it be but they didn't go to any of the other plants and so I'm just wondering like is there something to that Or am I crazy? No, no, you're totally uh, right. Uh, you didn't know the the species of aphids you you were encountered, but th there is some species of aphids are are uh, 
polyphagus uh, that we that will eat many um, uh, that, that will uh, feed on many types of plants. But there are some that are very specific, like for example, the cannabis aphids just attack cannabis. That's it. Uh, the hops aphids just attack hops. That's it. Even if they're two members of the cannabisia family, and you could graft a a hops plant to a cannabis plant, and then, uh, I mean, it doesn't matter. You the hops, aphid won't attack the cannabis plant. Oh, these so, are all, they were all cannabis plants, but they very specifically attacked only oh. specific cannabis plants that were in a cannabis, like there were no other plants. It was all cannabis plants, but they very specifically went to a particular plant or two particular plants. And we just moved oh. them, and they didn't infest any of the other cannabis plants. Okay, that so that uh, what you're saying, in fact, it means that um, they, they it must be the terpenes that are playing a role in um, in uh, the the like the the plants that uh, that, are, that have no aphids uh, must have. Uh, I think it's farcin, if I remember well. It's one uh, one one uh, terpene they don't like at all. So. Um, if you like that strain, I would favor these strains. Uh, it's good to have strains that are resistant to powder mildew and some that are uh, resistant to uh, kind of have their own protection against aphids. Um, it's interesting to have these traits into our genetic. Uh, and I, I, I believe as more, uh, there's a lot of people that are doing more research going back to the land races to try to find uh, these traits. Um, of, pro of protection, natural protection that's already built in into the the genetic, the natural genetic code of the plant. I'm not talking about the genetic manipulation like CRISPR or things like that, but uh, <clears throat> just naturally. So that's it. What you noticed, what you I think what you, you witnessed, if I'm right, uh, it it must have been uh, the something must have happened, or maybe the plants. Also, that uh, they weren't affected by the aphids at the high bricks level, and they weren't like really palatable for the aphid. Like, I mean, they weren't really uh, what the aphid wanted to to uh, to go for. Um, that's what uh, that's my theories. <laughs> yeah, it was really strange because, like, in our grow house or in our uh, greenhouse, we had you know, like 50, 50 plants of like two different strains, like 50 plants of each. And there was just one strain, just, and only a couple of plants of this one strain that were just covered in aphids and they just left everything else alone. And we were like, what the, what is, what is up with these, you know, two particular plants that the aphids are just feasting and they're leaving everything else alone. So it was not like, and I don't know, uh, you know, like, you never know how, um, you know, people can sell whatever they want and say, oh, yeah, this is an F whatever you strain and, and they're, you know, uniform and you don't know. Um, and they weren't. But I just was, you know, kind of curious. Um, like, maybe they were sick plants to begin with, so they just couldn't fight off. Maybe they, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I just wondered if you had any insight. But thank you for, for that. Yeah, I believe it. It must have, yeah, uh, like I said, like for the bricks level, it must have had something to do, maybe also for the, from the, 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 the overall health of the plant, the its immune system, how strong it was. And, mm. Awesome. Well, if, if that is all we have for questions for the day, we're going to give Flood a good evening to enjoy his his time because I'm, I'm sure you're very tired after a lift. Is there any other questions or comments, statements, or anything left to say on the table? Cool. Well, we're going to be back next. Hey, week. London. London. Yeah, I hear you, London. I'll add something just because you guys were talking about sulfur. Um, <clears throat> so realize that um, you know, as people are using cannabis and making concentrates, whenever you uh, concentrate 
the plant material, you're going to concentrate anything that's on that plant material, including sulfur. And so what was um, found was that um, when people, I guess, are using sulfur, which is really interesting because sulfur is actually uh, approved for organic farming. Um, and, uh, you know, that insults my chemical intelligence because sulfur is inorganic. How could it be organic, right? How could it be? Unless we're importing sulfur from Mars these days, all Mar all sulfur comes from planet Earth. So, you know, it, it all sulfur, I guess, is organic. But but uh, it, it's interesting because what happens is in a flask, the, the plant makes tetrahydrocannabinoids, and those um, tetrahydrocannabinoids are um, are what we would call what a chemist would call metastable, because when you concentrate tetrahydrocannabinoids in the presence of sulfur, chemistry happens, and actually you convert THC to CBN, and you make two moles of HHC out of that. And that was actually observed in a flask by researchers in the 70s and reported. But um, it was found in extracts as uh, late as uh, 2017 and 2018. It was brought to our attention because, as you know, we were the folks who patented um, hexahydrocannabinolic acid. And what these people were finding in extracts, these were out in, in Las Vegas, is that um, they were seeing hexahydrocannabinol in their distillate, but they couldn't explain why it wasn't the same retention time as THC. And they thought it was Delta-8, but the... Um, uh, one of the researchers was savvy enough to actually run the mass spec. And if you understand hexahydrocannabinol versus tetrahydrocannabinol, it has a different molecular weight. It has a molecular weight of 316. And so he observed this, and he had seen my talk on hexahydrocannabinolic acid. So he had reached out to me and said, hey, man, these guys are making distillate with hexahydrocannabinol in it, and they were intentionally hydrogenated. Now, HHC is made intentionally by hydrogenation, mostly of delta-8 outside um, the auspices of the cannabis industry and the so-called hemp industry. People are hydrogenating their delta-8 and making HHC. But when this was brought to our attention, we surmised that the HHC that was coming up in these distillates were an artifact of using sulfur as a as a uh, fungicide uh, to control fungus. And and when that when that cannabis was extracted and turned into distillate, and the distillate was heated up in the presence of that sulfur, chemistry happened and converted the THC to CBN and HHC, and, and that's, that's chemically known to happen. So it's not surprising that it doesn't happen. So I guess the moral of the story is that if you're using sulfur out there, um, you should probably do a sulfur analysis before you do extracts or processing of extracts in a way that would basically do that chemistry unless you're intending to do that. In a way, all you're doing is you're just promoting what's called a disproportionation reaction because THC will go up to CBN. It doesn't, it's not destroying the THC, it's just converting it to CBN. But in that process, in a THC distillate, it'll also reduce. When something is oxidized, something must be reduced. So in this case, a mole of THC goes up to CBN and uh, two hydrogen from that process reduce two moles of THC down to HHC. And we believe that's where the HHC was coming from in these distillates. And be people were making this stuff for a long time and they couldn't really explain the HPLC results. And then um, 
this one guy came along and basically figured it out and they're like, Oh, well, Hey, that's kind of cool. So anyway, I'm I, done that, talking. I think that's pretty cool. I mean, when you think about it, like it, it, it's like one of those things that we're not, those reactions we're not aware that we were doing, we're going to use sulfur as preventative and then it's going to alternatively caught, do something along the way. What's up? And, and sulfur, I'm not a, a big fan for IPM and, uh, and sulfur. It also, uh, for all the reasons that Dr. Mark uh, pointed out, I, I saw that happen also in bubble ash. Uh, the bubble ash like tasted like uh, matches. <laughs> it's like bubble ash. It's like uh, they thought they would save their stuff, and no, <laughs> it was even worse. They concentrated it. So even uh, like that's it. Even that when they do the stilt or the type of extraction can show up and like uh, mess up the chemistry. I provoke a, a lot of CBN, so it will be a sleepy extract on top of all the other things. Um, but the thing is, that's it. It will kill all good or bad mites um, in your field. And there was all like uh, what I've seen happen at different facilities that they swear by their sulfur to get rid of their PM. And they're more worried about PM than their aphid situation. And they... What happens is that they, they kill off with the sulfur all the aphid predators that throw in. And the uh, aphids, they just molt off the sulfur and they don't care. Uh, so it just leaves the aphids alive and kills off the, the parasitoids and the aphidus and the aphidolites, the, the aphid predator image uh, I was talking about earlier. And uh, the, even the anistis, uh, one of the only place that we release anistis, it didn't work. I inquired what they were doing, and I realized they were using sulfur every night. Uh, so the poor anesthetist uh, got a shower of sulfur every night. So uh, every, can... every night, every and, night. Oh yeah, every night. From, uh, from like veg to the end of veg, or like all uh, as, as soon as the symptoms appear, they go on, and uh, yeah, and it was I will stop your... attacking. Yeah. Wow. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so it's a sad thing, but uh, we hope to make them change their, their mind and find other ways for See, them to. That's that ounce of ounce of preventative is a pound of cure. It's like okay, let's yeah. just wait and then use a pound of sulfur. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Well, I, I just wanna... that's that's the oh. true deal because because it, it, in fact exactly what you just said, London is the description of a catalyst and, and what sulfur is. So a little bit of sulfur can catalyze a whole lot of this conversion because the sulfur kind of first, the sulfur gets, gets reduced because it accepts the hydrogen in, in, in taking the hydrogen, but then it, it donates the hydrogen back because the THC becomes the sacrificial hydrogen donor and hydrogen acceptor that's the magic of a of a disproportionation reaction so 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 exactly what you said a little bit of sulfur can go a long long way especially when you're heating this stuff up in like a distillation pot you know either getting rid of solvent or actually doing the distillation itself those are pretty rigorous chemical conditions so it only takes a trace amount of sulfur to really start changing your cannabinoid levels around quite a bit. The other thing I saw, which I wanted to get Quad's opinion on, I mean, I know that people have gone through um, a lot of um, uh, a means to control odor, especially around home grows, you know, for, for legal reasons, you know, not wanting to get in trouble, not wanting to stink up the neighborhood. And there's all kinds of contraptions that sell ozone generation and ozone generators and like sulfur ozone will react with terpenes ozone reacts with cannabinoids so i understand having like a curtain of ozone between your stinky grow and the rest of the world that you don't want to be stinky or you don't want the rest of the people out in the world knowing that you have a stinky grow on the other side of that curtain of ozone but I've seen products where they're actually introducing ozone into the grow, and that just doesn't seem right to me because it seems as though 
there's a lot of unsaturated compounds in the oil of cannabis that would react in a negative way with ozone. And I just don't think that that's the proper way to try to control odors. But just interested in, in, in what your opinion would be on that. Yes, like a peroxide that wouldn't spray either because of odor to trichomes, I'm pretty sure. Ozone, I had a customer come up to me, he said, oh, can I use an ozone generator at the, uh, the, the, the rate he was using as 1,050 milligrams per hour? Um, at two times 15 minutes every day, uh, will it hurt my beneficials? For sure, uh, it will hurt your beneficials and uh, it will also cause a reaction. Ozone can be also very dangerous uh, when you uh, breathe it in because it wants to get your oxygen. Um, so to uh, do a reaction, uh, we, we uh, certain biocontrol producers will use ozone uh, we don't. Uh, we use other means. Um, they will use it to sterilize the brand uh, before starting it to use for the brand mites and uh, ambitious productions like uh, for uh, Swirsky or Camarius or others that we uh, raise in brand with uh, brand mites. And uh, it, it will kill all the mites and the fungus in the brand because sometimes there's other mites that you don't want uh, some feeder mat, m brand mites, that species that you don't want. So uh, ozone will be used that way. Um, they also use ozone to sterilize rooms uh, between batches of, uh, like we do, trichoderma wasps, um, to make sure that uh, no brassica is present, that you have a pure uh, trichoderma minutum production. Uh, so that way they will use. But you, you see it's like a natural kind of a uh, gas chamber thing so uh, so yes for sure it's not uh, something i would i would uh, use in my plants at all um i remember back in the heritage legacy world uh, days uh, we had these cannons of uh, ozone uh, that we would put in the in a big scrubbing box to be sure that <laughs> the, the, the 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 smell would be taken care of uh, but we never and what happened also, uh, once some people I, I knew had put the, the ozone uh, cannon inside the grow room and what they ended up uh, a strain they grew that was usually so fragrant and so loud, uh, had almost no odor. So uh, it killed the, the terpenes in the plant. Itself. Wow. Wow. So, uh, I totally, yes. I totally believe that. I totally believe that. You, you, you know, the other thing, I, I, I don't know if you've seen this quite in, in the levels of the ozone that you're dealing with, but it attacks plastics. And in fact, w one of the ways that we would determine whether or not we've purged all the ozone from our reaction is we would blow up a little balloon and just run it over the reaction. And if the balloon popped, we know that there's still, there's still active ozone there. But yeah, I mean, like, I, I have one for my spa, my hot tub, you know, and you could smell the ozone that's being used there. And I sleep with a CPAP machine that I sterilize, you know, periodically with an ozone generator. So, yeah, ozone is quite useful, but I think the uh, the level at which it's, it's used, and I think, we, you know, when people are trying to develop new products in the cannabis industry and they don't really know what they're doing and they'll just think oh we could just blow ozone into the grow and it's totally fine like what you were saying sterilizing rooms in between grows or certainly using it for sterilizing equipment it certainly has its place it's very useful but like hydrogen peroxide these these are these are reactive oxidation um uh, uh, reagents. They're not just catalysts. They're stoichiometric reagents that will react with your, like you say, I, I'm not surprised at all when you tell me about that result, about the terpenes in that one room, because yeah, I mean, all of those molecules are very delicate and will uh, decompose if you stare cross-eyed at them, let alone hit them with an oxidant like ozone or 
you know, hydrogen peroxide is a little more gentle because typically, you know, those are very dilute solutions. It's not as concentrated as, as ozone can be, but uh, more concentrated solutions of hydrogen peroxide are actually uh, very dangerous. They're shock sensitive explosives. And one of the reasons why they can only ship uh, 30% aqueous solutions is because anything more concentrated, yeah, can just basically detonate if you, if you, <laughs> if you shake the bottle hard enough, you know, but um, I remember yeah, I what, 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 I what you're telling me though, and, and, and t tell me if this is true, that, that you shouldn't just be piping a uh, raw ozone into a cannabis grow to try to control pests, correct? Yes, exactly. And um, the thing is, is I would, uh, another way I could maybe, I would favor maybe using ozone is that if the, 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 the water um, that you have is pond water that you know is full of fusarium or is prone to other, like uh, to carry other disease, uh, for your plants, that it might be a solution too. Uh, that's cheap and is sufficient, and maybe even better than chlorination. Uh, fine, in a way, but uh, that's it. Like and like you had said, sterilizing equipment and uh, uh, and cleaning up, clean, cleaning up rooms. But uh, yeah, that's it. I would never use it in a grow by myself. Uh, that's for sure. I think this is, I'm really glad this came up because this is actually something that's come up recently. I, I was, I was at a co-op meeting, uh, some sort of a meeting or something like that. And, and somebody was presenting this and it's actually like the third or fourth of these style of products where I've seen they come from like, they can be either like a little small home unit to like fits in a ducting to storage and moving and transport and stuff like that. And the people that were producing it were very science driven, you know, doctors that, that had all been, you know, they were using it, experience using it in the medical field to keep areas clean and sterile. And, and, and I, I thought it was really interesting because, you know, let's take, even if you do the lowest dose po humanly possible, like that, that would have an effect, get it as low as possible. Every time you water your plant system, the air in your root base is exchanged with the air out of it. It's just, it's just how it works, guys. So when you, you when your medium dries, it draws air in. It's, it's, it's a tube. It's a tunnel. It's a movement of, of, of oxygen. So that means that that air that is ozonated is going into your root system, which means any bacteria in your root system are probably going to be negatively affected. So my, my, my whole thing where I was kind of like, this doesn't seem like a proper thing was like people spend hundreds, uh, like farms spend huge volumes of money, huge volumes of money for um, beneficial pests, beneficial um, bacteria and uh, mycorrhiza to help really develop and grow um, their plants and help get that extra strength out of them. So we're going to take, we're going to spend a hundred thousand dollars a year, you know, some of these really huge facilities, you know, we're going to spend a hundred thousand dollars a year on, on bio, you know, blah, 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 this, this inoculant of mycorrhiza or this blend of mycorrhiza. And then I'm going to oxygenate the room and kill all of it immediately. It's just like, it, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And I've seen this happen. And it's like, people don't really understand that, that, that there's a bacterial level that's necessary. And, and now even thinking about and hearing that from you, Dr. Mark, is how reactive cannabis and the, and the terpenes and, and, and the cannabinoids are, uh, it, it's, it even puts even more of a dough. It's like this trying to answer a problem that a lot of people are having with a solution that it doesn't necessarily increase the quality of the product. And I, and I think that there's alternatives. I think it's a really interesting thing to bring up. And I'm going to say this because it needs to be said uh, to those over in Future Cannabis Project. Casey Anderson, uh, who is in the audience and has been a regular guest since the start of the show, if, even before, like, fantastic human being. Yeah, I inform my boss. Uh, Thank you for discussing ozone. I worked at a large scale operation. They use generators to sterilize flour. I and other workers got ill for, for prolonged exposure. You know, like this is like, we're not even like, I don't know. It's like, I don't even know if this how much this frustrates me because it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, I want to add something to uh, something that uh, I was flabbergasted and when I saw that appear. 
Uh, in Canada, there's uh, Elk Canada that regulates the product that we can use in cannabis production. And there's, uh, I think right now it's 47 or 48 or 49 products I was uh, accepted for cannabis production. And I saw three products appear. They're about the same. Chloropicrin. Oh my God. I said, what? What is there? It's a poison. It's a, they use it to kind of sterilize the soil, to kill everything in it. I used to discourage my small food producers to use it, the strawberry growers. And some like didn't listen to me. And one day I, uh, I arrive at one of the fields, I will see these Guatemalan wor workers with the full body suit with this gas mask on and this tractor pulling this uh, tank and these injectors in the soil. And they would cover it with a plastic afterwards. It would kill everything in the soil for weeks or year, <laughs> months or even uh, longer. And I cannot believe they accepted that for. Uh, cannabis production uh there's another product that's natural that does the same effect uh, it's mustard seeds mustard meal seeds uh then i would advise my small food producer to, instead of using chloropicrin just grow some mustard and plow it down in your field afterwards uh, before it sets seeds so uh, that way you uh, release glucosinoids in the soil uh, that will kill uh, root, uh, root, not nematodes, the bad ones or the good ones, and uh, they will kill also the pathogens that are present in the soil. So there's a natural way to do it. I can believe it uh, that, that they accepted that they're, you know, like a, a real nasty chemical like it has a, on the label. It's a, a stop with the skull, you know. So it's really, really nasty. So I can believe that uh, if there anybody. From El Canada is a fan of cannabis and goes on the dank hour. <laughs> I'd like to, I would like them to contact me and explain to me why they accepted that product for cannabis production. <laughs> it's just so backwards. It's just like okay, they accept that, and then it's like you can't. You, you, if you have, if you test with hot with any levels of lactic acid, like with a higher level of lactic acid bacteria on your plant, you'll like. You won't be able to sell it. It's it's it becomes terminate <laughs> destroyable. Like it's like you know, you people pay to for labs, right? Lactic acid bacteria. People buy that stuff in bulk in the grocery store. It's like, but if it's on your weed, you know, it's dangerous, right? <laughs> so it's just some some things are interesting. I think it's it's different when you start combusting stuff. We actually have an expert. Oh, I can hear you, Johnny. We actually have an expert that will be joining us on the regular, Doctor Tess, who is a micro biologist and that's her whole realm so we'll be able to have her come in and join us there johnny you did before we end the night you did open your mic but you also like, looked like you wanted to say something earlier i think it was in regards to sulfur uh before we close up tonight did you want to let us know about yeah um i guess just touching on the the sulfur aspect it's yeah it's one of those things where you know dr mark and claude really like went into detail but it's one of those things I would only recommend um, like in extreme emergencies and obviously upon, you know, approaching flower, even uh, cut, cut off all, you know, protocol using sulfur to avoid a lot of those issues from happening. But um, I was just asking, I was going to ask Claude if that was, you said that was in Canada that they allowed that, that product that you were mentioning? Yes, it is uh, one of the 47 products accepted by Health Canada for cannabis production. Uh, and it, it's always uh, approved for either indoor, greenhouse, or outdoor. So chloropicrin is uh, accepted for outdoor. So it's used in the fields. Uh, it's not used in the facilities, though. Uh, uh, <laughs> thank God. Um, but uh, it's still in the field. It's really nasty. Uh, it doesn't cure a problem, too, because it destroys everyone. Uh, I mean, uh, meaning every uh, being in the microbial world, uh, like uh, the, the microfauna. So um, after that, uh, it leaves it open to uh, something nasty, maybe to establish itself. So uh, and uh, maybe some some will won't be killed and will just like uh, will be coming back with a vengeance. Like uh, I, I don't like uh, that type of uh, a product to be used. Um, for the um, uh, okay, I forgot what you had asked to uh, the, the second part of your question. 
if you can re just uh, repeat it, please. <laughs> Oh, I honestly, I think you, you kind of nailed it. I was just wondering where in particular, and it's amazing that they allow that kind of product to be used outside where it can just wreak havoc on, uh, you know, the microbial populations already established. And as you said, like, oftentimes when you apply this, the thing that comes back first and comes back with a vengeance is like the very things you were trying to um, fight. I've, I've seen that time and time again, people attempting to sterilize um, and, and completely eradicate all life. And what ends up coming back is the things that they were sterilizing for in the first place, those, those opportunistic pathogens. Exactly, exactly. And, and I, before we go, there was one last question. And I just, I did, I, I'll ask this openly to the group is, Andrew Relly Hand, and I actually, I th I'm pretty sure it's Relish Hand over at, at the Future Cannabis Project because I hopped in over here and asked, anyone tried methyl, oh shit. Anthri anthrinolate uh, for bud rot prevention, artificial grape. Mm, not sure. <laughs> yeah, I haven't. I think that's a new one. I've heard of this before. I heard of an artificial grape extract being used um, for a pathogen projection. I don't know much more about it. We, we, we probably are quite ready to give you a uh, it occurs naturally yeah it occurs naturally in, in grape or i don't know I, I read artificial grape for some reason it occurs naturally but regardless i haven't seen i don't know exactly what it is i've heard about this but we'll we'll we'll, we'll find out and learn more at some point in time i am definitely not the expert in the area quad is so before we go quad where can people find you to support you and then we will close out the room for the evening Okay, so I'm back from Lyft, but I'm uh, going back to another expo. Uh, I'll be at Okanabiz uh, from the 1st to the 3rd of June. Uh, Okanabiz is happening in Mississauga, uh, the International Convention Center there. Uh, so it's going to be a blast again to see people. There could be good speakers, uh, uh, different things happening there. Uh, after that, on the 15th and the 16th of June, I'll be at Cannabis Wiki in London, Ontario. Uh, so I'll be a speaker there. Uh, we won't have a boot, but I'll be hanging uh, out there and checking it out. It's the first time. I think it's the first year for the Cannabis Wiki event. Uh, I think it had been postponed in the past because of the COVID. I'm not too, too sure what I'm, say, what I'm saying, but anyways, it's happening on the 15th and 16th of June. And the week after that, I'll be in BC, in Victoria, for a Grow Up Expo. Um, so uh, it will be really, really fun again. Uh, even uh, uh, I just can't wait because I was supposed to go to the Growing Summit in Kelowna before the pandemic and got cancelled. And then this year in April, the Growing Summit got cancelled again. And then uh, you told me about this event, London, but it, then it was too late for me to go. But just can't yeah, wait. Yeah, it was Dr. so short. BC. It was like a week yeah. beforehand that I had. Um, exactly. Uh, so, so uh, I just can't wait to be back in BC. So on the twenty third, I'm gonna stay around for uh, another week after the expo. I think to go and check out farms and meet people and meet our partners that applied uh, over there and the, on the island of Vancouver. And go on Galliano and things like that. Uh, people uh, can check us out on uh, anatsisbioprotection.com or uh, our website. Um, I'm not too active on my Instagram, but uh, Claude uh, underscore the underscore Druid. Uh, I have some pictures of my the last time I grew freezing plants. I just can't wait back to growing myself and just helping other people grow. But uh, I think it's going to happen for me next year. <laughs> now I'm just growing vegetables where I am, so I can uh, I can grow some things, but I'm not growing cannabis, so I hope next year. Uh, Is your website uh, up for regular and con end user consumers? Because I know that wasn't up oh, last yes. time we spoke. It is up? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, So people, people yeah. can order less than 100 sachets of mites from your website right now, from the website oh, right yes. now. Oh, yes. There you go, yes. people. If you want less than 100 wet sachets of mites, Go check yes. out any of this bioprotect in the description. Yes, exactly. Uh, there's an online store, and uh, people can write me at C Robert C R O B 
E-R-T, -E <laughs> sorry, at anetsisbioprotection.com. And uh, I'll give them a discount count if they, they want uh, to buy something uh, on their store. Uh, if you have any questions too, uh, don't hesitate. I, I'd like to answer questions. So uh, see Robert at anetsisbioprotection.com. All in one word. And, so, if, uh, and if you missed that, his stuff is in the description. And if you reach out to me, I will also make sure to connect to you immediately because I have done it a few times as of yet um, because everybody's always looking for a French pest guy for some reason. You're like the most needed person in the world. <laughs> like, and, all, the, all the pest people are English. It's hilarious. And tomorrow, uh, the brown lace wing, Micromus Vargetus, will have lots of fun. I hope we'll see uh, uh, action. I've, I've, got, I've, got, I've got a plant that's like, that I didn't hose or do anything with that I didn't like fully kill. And we're just going to take it and put it in a container with just the lace wings. And there'll be like a few dozen aphids. And we'll just like let them go nuts. And then we'll release them. <laughs> just to finish, uh, just to add something uh, some uh, somebody said. Yeah, the most simplest way to get rid of it is to spray them down with cold water. Some will drown, but some will be back up on the plant. So uh, you have to be pumping it up. <laughs> but uh, we it's use other means. If you have no predators around or anything else, just like spring down, like uh, getting the, the, the them down of the plant it will help to control a bit. Uh, that's for sure. And, and yes, I think also, if they're eating too, won't it break their eating apparatus, like their little injector thing? Like if they're in the middle of eating and they get hit with a cold stream of water, they'll, it'll break oh, their, for their sure. eating. For, for sure, for sure, it will it will uh, annoy them and uh, stop them from feeding on your plants uh, for a while. And it's the same also for flea beetle. I don't know if they they are also out west. They're tiny, tiny black beetles. Uh, they appear uh, early in the season. Uh, they like it when it's very hot and sunny, and they will pierce little holes. Uh, especially they affect especially plantlets or seedlings. Uh, Full-grown plants are less affected. It doesn't really harm them that much. But uh, they are also re uh, being repelled by water. So we spray a cold spray of water, and they'll just uh, leave the plants alone for a couple hours. Then they'll be back. But then if you can re respray again, like uh, it's a way to uh, to uh, to uh, chase them. That's a, a solution. So uh, that's it. I just can't wait for tomorrow. So uh, thanks, everyone. And uh, don't hesitate you if you have questions uh, to ask me. And uh, I hope we can see uh, Matthew again, uh, too, uh, soon. Uh, Matthew Gates, I really liked uh, our interaction uh, the other times. I think maybe I'll try to invite him tomorrow uh, if I can reach out to him. <laughs> For sure. It's always fun to have a bunch of buggy guys around. And do definitely stay tuned for that one. I appreciate you all. I'm going to shut down the room and say goodbye to everybody else on Future Cannabis Project. Make sure to follow the club. Make sure to follow the people. And make sure to be back each week for another episode of The Dank Hour. We get dank-ass experts and talk about everything that you're passionate about in the cannabis space. Thank you. Bye. microphone we're gonna go to audio area hello can you guys hear me loud and clear probably hopefully you all can i know it looks like i'm coming through on the audio side hopefully i'm coming through loud and clear to everybody else in the world of the youtubes and the things i did post that link in the description below so you can make sure to check out and you just buy a check and i mean i can't tell you how awesome that is to not be able to buy a, not not have to buy 100 packets of anything um, especially for a small grower like myself. Regardless, let's run you through about what else is happening later on this week. It has been a busy day of Tuesday here with me, um, but tomorrow we have a lot of fun stuff going on. We have uh, growing with Marco at 1 o'clock, and then at 5 p.m. we're going to release those bugs with our bug brain experts, maybe both Matthew Gates and Claude. Who knows? We'll find out. It's always fun here at Super Future Cannabis Project. Don't forget to have fun. Check out everything. Follow the stuff. Do the things. And also, 
Don't forget to check out all the other great shows. I, I mean, I'm sure Guerrero, Guerrero will do a show tomorrow like he does most days. Um, so make sure to check out all of those fantastic things happening at Future Cannabis Project. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.